All right. Hello, everybody. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you come from. We're really happy uh, to have another session, uh, the last session of our autumn uh, series of the Law of Natures, um, a series of, of talks, um, this time uh, with Felix Finster. Uh, before Paula, our moderator, will introduce um, in, in the general session of, of the last uh, sessions, then how we go about the session. I will traditionally say a couple of uh, words about the Law of Nature's uh, initiative. So this is an initiative um, uh, where we try to promote a little bit the exchange between physics, philosophy and mathematics. We have, especially for this uh, series in the autumn 21-22, uh, uh, um, we had a quite colorful um, road <laughs> somehow. Uh, from uh, uh, mathematics or physics, mathematics and philosophy and, and um, uh, also a quite diverse audience of uh, people who, who joined us. Um, uh, the initiative, uh, just to say a couple of words, I mean, uh, most of you probably know, uh, it's, it's basically um, uh, someone founded uh, uh, with Angelo Bassi, organized by Angelo Bassi, um, um, Paula, uh, Archie Schirmer, and Wolf Struve, and myself. And um, we are now here at the last um, uh, talk of this autumn series with uh, uh, Felix Finster. And um, after uh, a little break in the spring, um, we will Again, uh, try to come up with a good pr program. Also, please write us if you have good ideas uh, about speakers. Uh, we might have also um, uh, a little poll uh, in, in the future. And there's also an upcoming conference uh, um, uh, about which we will inform very soon on the newsletter um, uh, to keep this initiative al alive. Okay, but I think I said enough um, about the Laws of Nature initiative. So I hand over uh, to Paula who will then introduce our speaker and the way we go about the session today. Thank you, Dick. <clears throat> so welcome everybody also from my side. I'm happy to see you here again in this last session of this um, autumn or rather winter series now. Um, yeah, so I'm happy that today's speaker is Professor Felix Finster from the University of Regensburg. He is working in the field of mathematical quantum physics and quantum field theory, and in particular on causal fermion systems. And today he is going to talk about this topic, and he will give two talks. So the first one is rather introductory, and the second one is a bit more advanced, though not too technical, so all of you should be able to follow. <laughs> um, we will have a break in between. So the first talk is about 45 minutes, and then we have a break to uh, take your questions, and then we have another talk and, and questions afterwards. Um, yeah, so please don't, don't ask questions in between, or yeah, if there is something urgent, just write it into the chat, and you will have enough time to ask all your questions after the talk. So <clears throat> let's start. Um, Professor Felix Finster, please. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this discussion series. I'm very happy about the opportunity to present causal fermion systems to a broader audience. And I'm also very much looking forward to the discussions afterwards. Maybe I should share my screen now. Let me see. Does this work? Okay. Yes, I it see this. Good. So the first of all, what is a causal fermion system? And in simple terms, it's an approach to fundamental physics, which involves a novel mathematical model of space time. And the physical equations are also formulated in such generalized space times, say quantum space times, if you like. And this approach and the whole setup were developed over many years. And usually when I give talks about this, I jump right into the basic definitions. And of course, Today, I want to proceed differently because I'm supposed to give a non-technical introduction to the basic ideas and concepts. And I thought that it might be best to outline step by step how things evolved. So therefore, I would like to invite you to a journey backwards in time. And we begin in 1989 when I was a young physics student 
and I was in a lecture on relativistic quantum mechanics or quantum field theory one, as it was called, called and this was following the books by Björk and Drell, Itzig Son Zuber, so this style of lecture. And of course, we learned about the Dirac theory and Dirac's whole theory. Probably most of you are familiar with this, but nevertheless, let me uh, recall a few basics. But the, the Dirac equation has solutions of positive and of negative energy. So if you consider the plane wave solutions in Minkowski space, there are solutions here on the upper mass shell, solutions of positive energy, so omega here is the frequency, and there are solutions of negative energy. And solutions of negative energy cause problems because there are no particles of negative energy, so what should this be? And Dirac came up with the idea of the Dirac C, and the idea is that in the vacuum, all the negative energy states are filled, forming the so-called Dirac C. Due to the Pauli exclusion principle, it is not the complete there. If you add additional particles, they cannot occupy C states because they are already occupied. Therefore, they have to occupy states of positive energy. So they, these are the particles, say electrons. And what one can also do is one can create a hole in the C. So one can take a state here, a solution of negative energy, bring it into a state of positive energy. Then what you get is a particle and moreover a hole in the C. And the C is, appears then as an anti-particle, so as, as, as a particle of positive energy, but the opposite charge, and these are the anti-particles. Okay. And while this is the naive picture as introduced by Dirac, and this has obvious problems. First of all, it gives rise to an infinite charge density and moreover an infinite negative energy density. And this is a problem if you want to couple the Dirac particle to, for example, classical fields, Maxwell field or the Einstein equations. For example, this infinite negative energy would cause an infinite curvature and then you get singularities right away. For this reason, we were told in the lecture why this sea of particles is not visible due to symmetries because this, they form a homogeneous isotropic state. As a consequence, you only see deviations of the sea. These are then particles and antiparticles. And the general message was forget about the Dirac C. This is no longer needed. So this was invented in the 1930s. But now we have the modern formulation of quantum field theory where this no longer appears. And this idea was also implemented in the formalism, which is also the standard formalism of quantum field theory, where one reinterprets the creation as annihilation operators and vice versa and one rig orders the Hamiltonian. In this way, one gets a new vacuum state, which corresponds to the C state, and the Hamiltonian only sees the deviations from this C configuration. Okay, so this is how we learned it. And at that time, I was not convinced by this procedure. What's the matter now? Something is wrong here, sorry. There's a problem, I don't somehow pages are missing. Sorry about it. I don't know what the problem here is. Yeah, take your time, just. Let me see, can I also do. I think maybe under Vorschau, uh, you can also see, I yeah, also have a full screen. Fine, let's, maybe, uh, maybe this PDF file is corrupt, but this would be a bit strange. Okay, sorry, I'm sorry about this problem. I mean, I tried it out earlier, there was no problem. Okay, let's just do it like this. Okay, good, now all these things are here. Can I also hear full build? Mm -hmm. Okay, and I think now things are working. Awesome. I think we, we stopped here. So this is what we learned in the lecture, but I was not convinced by this procedure for several reasons. First of all, if the, in, the Dirac particles are interacting, then the Dirac C should be visible. As a simple example, consider an external potential, say an electromagnetic potential. 
then all the Dirac particles are moving in, in, the, in this electromagnetic potential. As a consequence, the configurations of all these C states is no longer homogeneous and isotropic. And therefore there should, this whole C should be visible. There should be a net effect of all these wave functions. And moreover to me, the, the fact that there's pair creation and enter particle seems in direct evidence that the Dirac C is real. I mean, if there's no C, then what should a hole be? Then what is an enter particle? So this whole concept seemed quite unclear to me. Okay, then the question of course is what is the way out? And what I had in mind was, first of all, one should take the C state seriously. One should take the C states into account in all the constructions. But of course, if one does so, one has to avoid the usual problems. So what about these divergences, infinite charge density, infinite energy density? And I thought that one should maybe formulate a new type of equations which have a different structure from the usual, from the, oh, I see now it's bigger, but that's a bit too big, sorry. Okay, so in general terms, the goal was to formulate a variational principle directly for the ensemble of all these wave functions. And the intuitive picture is that all these wave functions, they organize themselves in such a way that the optimal configuration is the C configuration, the configuration of all these Dirac's. If you consider situation an interacting situation, then all these wave functions should organize to a solution of the Dirac equation, which now involves, for example, an electromagnetic potential. And this should serve as the definition of the electromagnetic potential. So this means the electromagnetic potential should not be an object I start from, but it's only a device in order to describe this whole ensemble of wave functions. So this was the general, of course, rather vague idea. And well, how can one make this more precise? The first attempts were that one describes this ensemble of all wave functions by a kernel. So this means I sum here over all the one particle wave functions. And here I have such cat bra combinations. So this gives me a two point kernel. And this describes the whole configuration of the wave functions. Okay, and now one should keep in mind gauge transformations and gauge invariance. Suppose I consider the situation in Minkowski space and the wave functions are Dirac wave functions in the presence of an electromagnetic potential. Then if I perform a usual gauge transformation on the electromagnetic potential, then the quantum mechanical wave functions pick up a certain gauge phase. As a consequence, also the kernel picks up gauge phases in this way. Now, if I want to form something in a gauge invariant way, then one is led to considering what I call, uh, call the closed chain. So I take products of these kernels, but always two neighboring arguments here are the same. And in this way, the gauge phases drop out. I mean, you can visualize it like this. This, this is <clears throat> P of X2, X1. I move from the space time point X1 to X2. Then I move to X3, X4, X5. And in the end, I move back to the point I started from. And what I get here, so this is a four by four matrix, which maps the spinners at the space time point X1 to itself. So therefore it's an endomorphism. I can compute the eigenvalues of this matrix. And then the idea is to <clears throat> introduce the, let's see, okay to form the Lagrangian out of the eigenvalues of this matrix, out of the eigenvalues of the closed chain. For example, by taking traces, traces of powers, polynomials of the resulting expressions. And then I form the action by integrating over all the space-time point. And here just, I just take the usual volume measure in Minkowski space. So then I have here a real number. 
And then one can vary all these wave functions and seek for critical points or for minima of this action. So this was the general idea. Of course, the basic question is, is this a sensible concept? Does this make sense mathematically? Does it make sense physically? And of course, a closely related question is, how should the Lagrangian look like? And here I use a few guiding principles. First of all, the Dirac C configuration, which I showed you at the very beginning, should be a critical point of the action or a minimizer, depending on which action you look at. Moreover, the Euler Lagrange equations of this action, they should reproduce the classical field equations, say Maxwell and Einstein, or later electroweak and strong equations. So these were the guiding principles. And now let me explain a little bit more how one proceeds here, a bit more technically. Don't worry, I mean, I don't want to, I won't enter any technicalities. This is just to get you a feeling of how one proceeds here. Suppose I write down the kernel of the fermionic projector of all the C state of the completely filled Dirac C. Then this is a distribution which has the following form. Well, first of all, here are the Dirac matrices. And then here I have a scalar distribution, which is the Fourier transform of the lower mass shell. And if I write this down in position space, then first of all, it depends only on the difference vector, which I denote by Xi. Xi square is the Minkowski inner product of this vector. So therefore this Xi square vanishes on the light cone. And then I get certain formulas here. And the only thing which counts here, one gets a distribution which has singularities on the light cone of a certain form. So one has here, PP is a principal part, a pole. One has a delta distribution. One has here logarithmic singularity and so on. If one now considers the situation in the presence of an electromagnetic potential, for example, or another gauge field, then one gets corresponding formulas, which are the formulas of the light cone expansion, or in case you are familiar with this, in, in curved space time, the corresponding expansion is called Hadamard expansion. So the point is one can also write down this distribution in a quite explicit form. And there are always smooth prefactors here which involve line integrals. So these are integrals along the light cone connecting the points X and Y. And the integrand here now involves the potential, the electromagnetic potential, but also derivatives, in particular here, the Maxwell current, the fields tensor derivative of the, of the Maxwell current and so on. So they're always here smooth prefactors. And they are multiplied by distributions which are again singular on the light cone. So which whatever here has a logarithmic singularity and so on. This first term here, this is the, gives the most singular contribution. This can be understood from gauge invariance. It just gives precisely these gauge phases which I showed you before. But then there are many other terms which involves the current and the electromagnetic field tensor. Well, and then the game is when you start from this kernel, you form composite expressions like the closed chain. You put this into the, into the action, you compute things, and then you try to get back, for example, the Maxwell equations. So this is what I did for quite some time. In fact, there are two archive preprints where you see many of the computations and also some explanations. And around 1996, well, say a few things were already clear. First of all, that this makes sense only if one considers two point actions or if the closed chain consists of two points. So only consider the closed chain where I go from the point X to the point Y and then back to the point X. And the reason is roughly speaking that otherwise electromagnetic fluxes come into play and then you don't get dynamical equations anymore. 
Next, if one considers this product here, P of X, Y times P of Y, X, then each of these factors is a distribution which has singularities on the light cone. If you multiply these distributions point-wise, then you get something which is, does, is, is ill-defined on the light cone. You get divergences on the light cone. This is why one needs an ultraviolet regularization. So here I just denoted by epsilon. You can think of this epsilon as the Planck scale. One smears out things on a small scale. Then one can form composite expressions. And then one can also make mathematical sense of, for example, the Lagrangian. And around 2001, I came up with a concrete proposal for how this Lagrangian should look like. So this is, this is it. So one takes absolute values of the eigenvalues of the closed chain. I mean, this AXY is a four by four matrix. It has four in general complex eigenvalues. I take the absolute values square, take the difference squared and sum over all the eigenvalues. This is how it works. And one can even show that this is the only Lagrangian which can potentially make sense. So you see all this in this book, which appeared in 2006. Well, of course, I don't want to enter all the details. I just want to explain a few things here, namely, why do absolute values of the eigenvalues come up? Because this is kind of important later for causal structure, also why it's called causal fermion system. And some of these absolute values come about for several reasons. First of all, because then the eigen, the phases of the eigenvalues drop out. Well, obviously, if you take the absolute value, the phase is out. And this is, turns out to be crucial if you want to have a system which involves chiral gauge fields. So in particular, left-handed gauge fields, the left-hand SU2 gauge field. So this is why you need to take the phases should go out. This is why you take absolute values. But moreover, and maybe more importantly, also one gets a connection to causality. Let me quickly explain how this goes because the computation is not so difficult and well, you can ignore the details, of course, if you are not interested in it. Suppose we consider this P of X, Y in Minkowski space, and then everything depends only on this difference vector Xi. And let's suppose that this vector is not light-like. So we are away from the light cone, in this case, this P of X, Y is well-defined, it's a smooth function, in fact. And due to Lorentz symmetry, you already know that it has this specific form. So it has a vectorial component, which involves this difference vector and the scalar component. And alpha and beta here are just complex numbers. Then P of Y, X is the adjoint. You simply take the complex conjugate of alpha and beta. And if we now form the closed chain, then you get something which again has a vectorial component and a scalar component. And the point is that A and B are both real values. And this comes from the fact that this AXY is a symmetric operator with respect to the spin, spin in that product. Now we need to compute the eigenvalues of this matrix. And then we see right away from here that it satisfies this polynomial equation. So therefore, the roots of these polynomials are the eigenvalues. This means here you have explicit formulas for the eigenvalues. And now the important point is, if y and x are time-like separated, then this Minkowski inner, pro inner product is positive. Then the square root is real. So therefore, you get two real eigenvalues. On the other hand, if this difference vector is space-like, then this Minkowski inner product is, product is negative. And as a consequence, the eigenvalues form a complex conjugate pair. So therefore, the form of the eigenvalues reflects the causal structure. And if you take now absolute values of the, eigen, of the eigenvalues, then in the space-like case, all the eigenvalues have the same absolute value and therefore the Lagrangian vanishes. Okay, so this is how the, these absolute values can be understood. Okay, so this was the status around 2006. So let me just quickly summarize. I mean, we started in the standard setup. We are in Minkowski space. We use all the structures therein. We have the causal and metric structures. We have Dirac matrices, Dirac wave functions, the electromagnetic potential and all of that. 
And then in addition, we formulate a new action principle, which is formed out of this kernel of the fermionic projector involves a specific action and space-time integrals. Okay, so this is quite nice, but it's conceptually somewhat unclear because there are too many structures here. For example, I mean, the Dirac matrices, they come up here, but they do not enter the, the action principle in the end. So maybe we don't need them. The same is here with the electromagnetic potential. I mean, so for formulating this action principle, you don't need all that. Also, for example, the causal structure. I mean, there's of course the causal structure in Minkowski space, but there are also this pole structure of the kernel of the fermionic projector, which in some sense also reflects causality. So therefore, somehow we have too many structures here. As a consequence, the setting is somewhat unclear conceptually. <clears throat> and in order to clarify things, the strategy is to drop all the structures which are not essential. And by not essential, I mean all the structures which are not needed for the formulation of the causal action principle. In particular, we don't need the Minkowski metric, we don't need its causal structure, we don't need the Dirac matrices, Dirac equation, gauge potential, Maxwell equations, and all of that. I just forget about all of this. What I need to keep is, first of all, this script M, say Minkowski space, as a topological space with a measure. So we need to be able to speak of space time volumes because we integrate in the causal action. We also need spinner spaces. So we have a, we need a vector bundle and the fibers need to be endowed with a fiber metric. We need wave functions. And moreover, we need a Hilbert space structure. Well, in this Hilbert space structure might not quite so obvious. Why do we need this? Well, in simple terms, if we write this kernel down, then somehow we need to say, well, how, what is A here? And this should be the index of an orthonormal basis. In order to speak of orthonormal basis, we need Hilbert spaces. Okay, now here we dropped many structures and the idea is that they should be emerged. So this means in the end, they should reappear from the more general setup, but they should are not supposed or considered to be fundamental. Okay, so this is the idea. And this is this was the strategy back then. And this was led, first of all, to a setting in discrete space-time, which I don't want to speak about here. You can look it up in the book, also it's not so important <clears throat> in retrospect. It seems more important to explain you two constructions, which turned out to be very helpful. And the first construction is to work with a local correlation operator. Now, what is that? I mean, so far we had the kernel of the fermionic projector and we formed the closed chain. Now, the point is that the eigenvalues of the closed chain, they can also be computed in a different way. Namely, <clears throat> this matrix here is isospectral to the operator product f of y times f of x, where this operator f of x here, this is a local correlation operator, and its matrix entries are formed by inner products of the wave functions at a given space-time point. So you can think of the diagonal entries here as the densities of the wave functions and the off-diagonal entries that tell you about the correlations of the wave function psi A and psi B at a given space-time point. And the first advantage of doing this is that the gauge phases drop out. You can think of this as an expectation value at a space-time point, and therefore the gauge phases out. So therefore it gives you gauge invariant formulation. And the second advantage is that you no longer need the bundle structure. You don't need to spin spaces, spinners, and so on anymore. Instead, we just work with this operators on the Hilbert space. Okay, so this is one construction and I thought that it might be helpful to just explain you why are, why are these operators isospectral? So I mean, why does AXY and F of X times F of Y have the same eigenvalues? Because this is a quite a simple computation and it might be helpful just to show you how this goes. 
okay, if you want to show that two operators have the same spectrum, then it suffices to consider powers and compute the traces. Because once you know that all the, or you call them invariant polynomials are the same, then also the characteristic polynomials are the same, and then we have the same eigenvalues, including uh, algebraic multiplicities. Okay, this is why we consider the trace of AXY to the piece power. Well, then you write this out. So this is of the upper, this matrix to the P minus first power. This is AXY here written out in detail. P of XY, which I express in terms of all the wave functions multiplied by P of YX. And then I take the trace of this matrix. Well, and now I can cyclically commute the trace. I can also write it like this. And then if I write this P of YX, again, in terms of wave functions, then right here, I get the local correlation operator at the point Y. And then I can proceed inductively. And then I find in the end that this trace is the same as the trace of all these operator products. So this is why we have this isospectrality. Okay. And now there's a final simplification, namely we can also get rid of space time itself. So we wanted, we can get rid of Minkowski space. How is this supposed to work? And to this end, one works again with these local correlation operators. And the first observation is that these are all symmetric operators on this complex Hilbert space or self-adjoint operators of rank at most four, which have at most two positive and at most two negative eigenvalues. Well, and this comes from the fact that we take here an inner product, we have here an inner product of signature two, two. So the dimension of the spinners and the signature of this inner product this reflects, is reflected in the number of positive and negative eigenvalues of this operator f of x. Okay, now if we denote all these operators by curly f, so this is a subset of the linear operators, then we end up with the following picture. So on the left side, we have Minkowski space. On the right side, we have the set of all these linear operators with these specific properties. And then to every point in Minkowski space, we can associate the corresponding local correlation operator, which gives you a point here on the right. And now we take the push forward measure. So somehow the only structure we need of Minkowski space is the volume measure. And now we can transport the volume measure to get a corresponding volume measure here on the right. And this is the so-called push forward measure. The way this works technically is, suppose you take a subset omega of curly F and you want to compute its volume. Then what you do is you take the, its pre-image, which gives you a subset of Minkowski space. And then we can simply take the usual space-time volume of the subset so just here, the four-dimensional Lebesgue measure, say. Okay, then we have a measure here on the right side. And the good thing is that the support of this measure is the same as the image of this mapping capital F. So in this way, we can still recover the space-time space on the right side, simply by taking the support of the measure. And with this in mind, we can forget about what we have on the left. We can work exclusively with the objects on the right. And this is then what gives the causal fermion system. Okay, and I think now we are ready for the general definition. So this is what a causal fermion system is. So we have a Hilbert space, just an abstract Hilbert space complex. We are given a parameter n, the spin dimension, which in the example so far was always two. Then we consider the set of all linear operators, which are self-adjoint, have finite rank, have at most n positive and at most n negative eigenvalues. And finally, we consider a measure on this set of operators. And here's how you can try to visualize this. So this yellow set, this is curly F. So the whole blackboard here, so this is the Hilbert, this is the uh, L of H, so all the linear operators. One should keep in mind this curly F is not a subspace, it's not a vector space, it's just a subset. 
but it has this ray shape. So if you take an operator there, then if you multiply this by any real number, you again get an operator inside the set. Well, then we have a measure on curly F and this green set here, this is supposed to be the support of this measure. And this can be have a continuous structure like here, but it could also have a discrete structure, discrete space time port, for example, all this is possible. Okay, and now we can formulate the causal action principle in this more general setting. And it works well, quite similar to what I showed you at the very beginning, except that now we are working with the operators in curly F. So suppose we have like two linear operators in curly F. Well, then we can multiply them together. So the, and then we get a new operator, which has a rank at, again at most to N, but it's in general no longer symmetric because taking the adjoint flips the two operators, but the operators do not commute in general. This is why the eigenvalues here are in general complex. So we get like two N complex numbers. Well, and then we can form the Lagrangian as before and integrating now with respect to the measure rho gives you the action. This action is non-negative, so therefore we can minimize this under variations of the measure rho. Well, in order to get something which makes mathematical sense, one needs certain constraints, the volume constraint, trace constraint, and boundedness constraint. Well, I don't want to say too much about this, maybe just the volume constraint. I mean, somehow you need this constraint in order to avoid trivial minimizers. Without this volume constraint, I could simply take the zero measure and this would be a minimizer. Of course, that's not what we want. This is why we fix the total volume to be, for example, one. Okay, in any case, so in, in this way, you get something which is mathematically well-defined. There are minimizers. So this is quite nice. And well, I think now I'm coming towards the end of the first talk, and I want to conclude with a few remarks to explain a little bit what the general structure here is, and also maybe in order to enrich the discussion afterwards. First of all, I want to point out that there's just one object left, namely we have the measure rho, which is a measure on a set of linear operators on the Hilbert space. And this measure describes everything. So it describes space time as well as all the objects therein. And there are some other, there is an underlying structure of, with this ensemble of wave functions, what I showed you at the beginning, this is somehow still here. So this is present in this setting. I will explain this in more detail later. So one can really think of this measure as being formed of this ensemble of wave functions. The geometric structures of space time, they are also encoded in the measure. So, or equivalently, they are encoded in all these wave functions. And in simple terms, you can understand this that meta encodes geometry. So, all these wave functions which form the Dirac sea, they carry the geometric information and they tell space time about the geometry. And since these wave functions are all quantum particles, you can also understand this that we have a quantum space time here. I also wanted to mention that this causal action principle describes space time as a whole. So this is a bit similar to the Einstein Hilbert action. You have a, a functional defined in space time, you look for a critical point and then space time as a whole is, comes out. I also wanted to point out that this causal action principle is nonlinear. So this is really similar to classical field theory, similar to the Einstein-Hilbert action. Nevertheless, one gets the linear dynamics of quantum theory in a specific limiting case. I will explain this a bit more in my second talk, also in connection of collapse phenomena. So this is a bit the general structure. Maybe let me also mention the underlying physical principles briefly. So some of what have we built in? Some of the local gauge principle was built in. I mean, you remember these gauge phases which had to drop out and so on. In the final formulation, this corresponds to the freedom to perform local unitary transformation of the spinners. 
also the, the Pauli exclusion principle is built in, maybe not in a, well, not an obvious way, but a simple way of understanding this. I mean, we have a Hilbert space, which can be thought of as the one particle Hilbert space, which describes all the occupied states of the system. Now, if you take the anti-symmetric wedge product of all these wave functions, then you get a Hartree Fox state. And in this way, the Pauli exclusion principle is respected. In fact, we'll see later whatever more sophisticated ways of seeing that the Pauli exclusion principle is built in here. Finally, the equivalence principle is also built in in a kind of general way. Namely, one way of stating the equivalence principle is that the physical equation should be formulated geometrically in terms of the Lorentzian metric. And in particular, all of this is diffeomorphism invariant. It doesn't depend on the choice of coordinates. Here, the structure of space-time is you have much less structures. M is merely a topological measure space. And if you want to describe this with charts, for example, then there's a lot of more freedom to choose coordinates and all of that. And the causal action principle does not depend on choices of coordinates or anything like that. So therefore, there's a much bigger, whatever, invariance, uh, what class of invariance of symmetry transformations which you can perform. However, space-time and the causal structure, this is all emergent. Okay, of course, we can discuss this later, maybe in a bit more detail. I wanted to conclude by saying that, well, often I'm asked, well, how can all these mathematical objects be interpreted? What does all this mean? Well, and honestly, I think very much in mathematical terms. Therefore, for me personally, I always find it a bit difficult or even a bit problematic to rephrase all this in ordinary language. But of course, I know in particular here, there are physicists and philosophers and whatever, many mathematicians and everybody thinks in a different way about nature. And also I agree that of course, one needs to have a good intuition of what all this is about. So what can we do here? And what I find helpful is to consider this mathematical setup from different perspectives and to try to visualize things from this specific perspective. And one should, of course, keep in mind that the resulting picture is oversimplified and only captures certain aspects of the mathematical structures. But hopefully, by combining several such pictures, one can get a more complete intu intuitive understanding. And one picture which I find helpful, which I already mentioned earlier, is that of wave functions which organize themselves according to the causal action principle. And they try to get into the optimal configuration. And this optimal configuration then gives rise to the usual space-time structures. Another quite different picture is what I want to show you now, namely is an interpretation in ter terms of space-time events. This is really quite different than any, well, so we had these operators in curly F, which came up as the local correlation operators. You can say, well, these are the possible local correlation operators, or you can also say this a bit more catchy. These are the possible events in space times, in space time, possible events which could happen. The operators in M, so the support of the measure, these are those events which are realized in our space time. In other words, space time is made up of all the realized events, and the physical equations relate all the events to each other. And if one looks at it like this, then this is somewhat related or similar to this ETH a formulation of quantum theory, which Jörg Fröhlich presented a few weeks ago. In fact, we have a paper where we worked out this connection. Uh, and well, of course, there's a certain similarity. So we can also get an analog of this principle of diminishing potentialities, as Jörg called them. But of course, there are also many differences, in particular, this causal action principle and these whole physical wave functions and all of that. Okay, good. Let's see what's the timing. Okay, fine. I think that's a good point for the first break. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. Okay, thank you very much for this nice talk.
Okay, so please, if you have a question, just um, raise your hand so that I see you. Okay, Dirk, so. Okay, Felix, my, so first, thanks for um, the first half of, of your talk. Um, um, I saw, of course, a couple of talks uh, from you earlier, but now it helped me to uh, recollect a couple of these memories. Um, so my first, uh, maybe also a bit more technical question first would be, um, so as I understood correctly, the ingredients that you have um, is basically an abstract Hilbert space H, then mm -hmm. you have this topological measure space M, and uh, then you form with this um, L of H, these, these linear operators, basically the action principle. Yeah? And, mm -hmm. yes. um, and somehow what is minimized is, is basically this measure row. Exactly. Um, so that you minimize this action under variations of the measure. Exactly. Yeah. And um, so, so in order to get the connection to, for example, Dirac uh, C uh, theory with an external field, um, do I understand correctly that the first step is that um, you introduce then a special representation of this Hilbert space, for example, as an, an L2 and R3 C4, and, um, and, and somehow work with these uh, linear operators in, in, in terms of these, um, uh, uh, basically these correlation functions uh, that you show, and then in this representation, uh, you somehow can recover this uh, this picture of, of, of wave functions um, mm -hmm. again. No, okay, so, so let me try to, to answer. I mean, I mean, in the talk, I started with an, kind of an example, if you like. I started in Minkowski space, and then I constructed a causal fermion system. So then you have a this, then you are in this setting here, but you have a very specific measure. And we dropped many structures, but in fact, those structures which we dropped, we can recover. In fact, I will explain this in detail at the, at the beginning of the second talk. So in other words, nothing is lost, but uh, of course we have a very specific measure which describes, for example, the Minkowski vacuum. You can also take a classic system with whatever an electromagnetic potential, and then you get a new causal Fermat system with a different measure. Okay, and then now if you want to analyze the dynamics or you want to get the connection between the different settings, the crucial question is always, well, is the measure row here, is it a minimizer of the causal action principle? And the way the causal action principle is designed, if you like, is that this Dirac C configuration really is a minimizer. So this means you have one example of a minimizing measure, at least in a certain limiting case, if you take out, uh, if you remove the ultraviolet regularization, then you get a minimizer. So in this way, so the Minkowski vacuum is a specific minimizer of the causal action principle. And then one can ask the question, well, are there other minimizers? And one can in fact construct other minimizers by perturbing this one known minimizer. Mm -hmm. This makes it then possible to analyze interacting systems. Mm -hmm. So I understand correctly that, that both the, the, the free theory and the interacting theory uh, come out as mini, um, as, as extrema somehow of, of the action. Yeah, ex exactly, exactly. Uh, I see. Yeah, I, I guess my question was a bit more towards, uh, um, from this abstract uh, um, setting, how you then, for example, get the connection again to wave functions in Minkowski space. Mm -hmm. But I guess it, it's, it's really then a question of how do I represent this Hilbert space? Do, do I use an L2 mm -hmm. of wave functions or do I use something else, right? So a little okay, bit like... Yeah. Exactly. So somehow like here, the Hilbert space, this is no longer Hilbert space of wave functions. It's just mm -hmm. something abstract. Okay. And if you start from this abstract setting, then you can, again, construct wave functions. Mm -hmm. Because wave functions are not in Minkowski space, but on this support of this measure. So everything is on a kind of more abstract level, but you... In principle, you get the same structures which were started from. You can get spinners, you have an inner product on the spinners, you get wave functions and all of that. And then if you want to really make a clear connection, one has to identify things. So one has to identify, for example, points of Minkowski space with points of M. So this is mm -hmm. clear how to do it. You just identify the point here 
with a point here. But then you can go on, you identify the spinners at a point here with a certain subspace of the Hilbert space on the, on the other side. Mm -hmm. so in other words, one can always write down certain mathematical identification of objects. And then one gets correspondence in the sense that if I consider the example of this Dirac-Sy vacuum and I take the limit epsilon to zero, then all these uh, identifications become isomorphisms. Mm -hmm. I see. And, and uh, maybe another question, I mean, uh, do you know um, something about the multiplicity of, of these extrema? So for example, you would of course be interested in like what kind of different interactions uh, um, yeah, does this uh, action principle entail? Okay, this is of course a good question. I mean, this is our the basic question is like, well, how do minimizing measures look like? And we kind mm -hmm. of classify them. How do they typically look like? And unfortunately, there is not much known. I mean, we analyze this in small dimensions. If the Silbert space here is two or four or eight mm -hmm. dimensional, then one can analyze this numerically. And then one understands pretty well what's going on. Mm -hmm. But what we have in mind here, the Hilbert space should be very large because it should include all the C states. So ideally the dimension should go to infinity. And in this case, it is unclear how minimizers typically look like. The only thing we know is, well, we have one specific minimizer, namely the one describing this Dirac C vacuum. And starting from there, one can perturb the system and then really uh, analyze interacting systems and so on. Mm -hmm. okay. But this is only, well, only measures which are close to Minkowski vac vacua somehow. I see. Mm -hmm. There could be minimizers of completely different form. We don't know anything about that. I mean, generally speaking, what one sees is there are many minimizers, even like in low dimensions. I mean, this is a non-convex variational problem. So there's far from being a unique minimum. There are many local minimizer, mm -hmm. minimizers. Mm -hmm. And the picture is that every physical system corresponds to a minimizing measure. And mm -hmm. then by whatever, if you, for example, prescribe initial data, then this initial data tells you which minimizing measure you should pick. I see. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that, that's somehow, uh, to, to be fair, an additional ingredient uh, that, that you would need for, for describing a particular system. Okay, sure. But I mean, it's the same for the Einstein equations. I mean, if you only mm -hmm. write down the Einstein equations, then you don't know which system you're talking about. I mean, you have to specify initial data in order to... I see, yeah. I mean, it's somehow from the, well... Okay, but, but uh, uh, well, the, the picture is quite similar to, say, the Einstein Hilbert action, for example. Mm -hmm. But that helped me a lot. No. Thanks. Okay. Okay, so the next question is by Ward. Please, Ward, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Felix. Yeah, I, I think Dirk just basically asked my question. Like, my question would have been like, what's the connection to QED, or what do you hope will be the connection to QED? But uh, from your answer to Dirk, I, I pretty much got what you were saying, but, but something else. Uh, so like the space time that's going to be emergent, uh, that's just going to be curved space time. Or do you want to go beyond that and like maybe have some like a quantum theory for gravity or? or... Well, of course, I mean, ideally, this should also describe uh, quantum space time, quantum gravity and all of that. I mean, for the moment, we can mainly consider, say, like this example in Minkowski space, you can also consider similar examples in curved space time. So you start from a, say, globally Lorentzian hyperbolic space time, then you have a nice Dirac solution space, you can form local correlation operators, and so on. And this causal action principle also gives you back at least linearized gravity. Okay. Okay. And uh, yeah, okay. And in fact, in, in the second talk, I want to go towards quantum field theory. And uh, hopefully, this will answer some of the question you mentioned like, what about quantum field theory? How can quantum fields be described in this setting? Of course, I haven't talked about this yet. And, and you want the, the hope is just to get like another picture for, like, say, QED, or, or you want to go beyond that and like have a different theory which deviates from QED. Exactly. So I mean, I really, I mean, I, I want to go beyond QED and also hopefully resolve the problems of QED of quantum gravity. 
And the idea is that, well, I have this kind of general space times described by such measures, and then I have a new action principle. And then I want to analyze minimizers. And of course, in a certain limiting case, you should give back the standard quantum theory. But this is a limiting case where you remove the ultraviolet cutoff, which is somehow here built in. I mean, the causal Fermi system, the, the basic objects are always the regularized objects, including a cutoff. So therefore, as long as you stay within the causal Fermi system setting, everything should be well defined, no mathematical problems, no infinities. And maybe this is the correct physical description. And if you take the limiting case to get, for example, QED back, then of course you again run into the usual problems. You need to renormalize and all of that. But maybe this is simply because you take the not so good, not so well behaved limiting case. So this is what I have in mind, but of course there is a lot to be done in this direction. Okay, th thanks. Okay, so there's one more question by Tejinder Singh, Mr. Singh. Yeah, hi, thank you. Hi, Felix. Hi. So nice thank to you see you. Nice talk. Nice to see you again. Uh, I wanted to ask you a general question: Is there a way to see how one might say make contact with the standard model? of particle physics and start getting numbers out, like mm -hmm. the free parameters of the standard model? Yeah, good question. I mean, in the second part of the talk, I will in fact tell you roughly how to get contact to the standard model. And one can write down a system which really gives you back the interactions of the standard model. Oh. And to this end, one has to kind of put in how the vacuum looks like. In particular, one gets like eight, a direct sum of eight sectors. So direct sum of eight Dirac spinners, if you like. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, and then one gets back the standard model. And well, hopefully one can also go beyond the standard model, but there's not much, not much has been worked out. Yet. The, the, eight reminds me, do you see octonions again? Good question. I mean, of course, this is also what we discussed after your talk two weeks ago. <laughs> so, <laughs> the connection I see right now, of course, is the number eight is the same. Yeah. So this means we have we are also get naturally eight by eight matrices. That's very interesting. Get octonions. I mean, I, I'm, I'm still having a bit trouble with the fact that these octonions is non-associative. So somehow you have an operation which is non-associative. Yeah, if I work if I here I usually get operators on the Hilbert space, and if I multiply them together, I mean this is always associative. Yeah, so actually that's not, not that's the not, are not so clear to me yet. The non-associativity is not very difficult to overcome. While so instead of working directly with the octonions, we work with maps from one octonion to another, and the maps are associated. Uh -huh, okay. so that problem is not, not difficult to overcome, but you, I agree with you that that must be taken care of. But it's very interesting that you again have these eight by eight, I think complex matrices, because that is just the Clifford algebra CL6, which comes very naturally from these octonionic mm -hmm. maps. So it's very interesting for me that in the end, we probably seem to meet uh, at some point, yeah. Okay, so I agree. So I mean, this I mean, we should definitely explore this further, and hopefully, we can get make this connection a bit tighter. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. So there is uh, one more question by Lorenzo Marcone. Please go ahead. Yes, yeah, so, uh, it's not really clear to me the connection to the physics, uh, like. How, how do you interpret the events? And uh, so, so you were talking about events. What kind of events do you have in mind? Like uh, interaction between particles or particle detection events? Uh, okay, good. I mean, good question, of course. I mean, here I called it events. I mean, what I mean is really this local correlation operator. And uh, by... Well, I mean, I know, of course, this abstract definition by Jörg Fröhlich of what an event is, or what the centralizer of the center of these algebras. I mean, this is something you can also do here, but maybe this doesn't really help you to understand what, what an event should be here. I mean, the only thing I mean here is 
Um, somehow, you, if you think space time is made up of all these wave functions, and then you look at this at a given space time point, and you just wonder, well, how does how do all these wave functions look like in this one at this one space time point? This is what I mean by an event. Okay. And well, and if I think of, of it like this, well, then the, the physical equations, they relate all these different events with each other. In other words, how things look at one space time point has an effect on how things look at a different space time point. So this is all I have in mind here. I mean, maybe one could go in the direction of whatever one performs a measurement somewhere, but maybe that's already a bit too much. Okay, so, so the wave functions are not just defined over space conditioned on time, but the wave functions you're talking about are defined on space time. Exactly. So everything takes place in space time. So you have wave functions in space time, and you so, have space time so, points, and then one can evaluate these wave functions at a given space time point and take their inner products at this point. Thank you. Okay. I should also say at this stage, it's just we are in the one particle picture. So these are all one particle wave functions. In fact, quantum states and many particle wave functions will come later in the second talk. Okay, so here's another question by Jose Isidro. Hi, Felix. Hi, nice um, to see you. I was wondering, uh, so far you seem to me to have concentrated on, the, uh, on those aspects that have a bearing on general relativity and quantum field theory. I was wondering uh, if you'd like to comment on possible implications of your approach concerning the foundations of quantum theory, open problems in ordinary quantum mechanics, like the measurement problem and the mm -hmm. like. Yeah, are there any, any thoughts on that that you would like to share with us? Well, there are thoughts, I mean, mainly together with Johannes Kleiner, who thought about these things as well during his PhD thesis. And well, maybe it has, let me just go back here to, this relates somehow to the last point here. Namely, so we have like a nonlinear variational principle, but in a certain limiting case, one gets linear equations back. I will show you at the, in the, at the end of the, the second talk, hopefully how this goes. But this means that this linearity, say this superposition principle only holds in a certain limiting case. So also it doesn't hold on all scales, on all energy and, and length scales. So therefore the idea is that, I mean, in a typical quantum system, you are in the regime where the equations behave linearly, like linear time evolution on Fox spaces. But at some point, the nonlinearity comes into play, and as a consequence, a dynamical collapse happens. So the idea, what I have in mind, also what Johannes has in mind, is something similar to this dynamical collapse theories by like Angelo Bassi. I mean, he was also in the audience here today. Probably he can say much more about this. So the, the idea is to get the connection to this dynamical collapse theories. But here, the nonlinearity just comes from the nonlinearity of the causal action principle. I should say that one also needs some stochastic terms or some kind of randomness. And this should come out from the unknown microscopic space-time structure. So the idea is that on small scales, space-time is fluctuating. And if you want to describe these fluctuations by whatever with the stochastic processes, this should give rise to this stochastic term, which there is in this non this. Uh, uh, um, dynamical collapse theory. So there's always a nonlinear term and a stochastic term. I see. Mm. Thanks. Okay, thank you. So I think if there are no further questions at this point, I think it's a good point to go on with the second part of the talk. Okay, but just one you want a break or is well, I would just like to set up this PDF file properly. Okay. <laughs> So okay, let's sorry for this for break this and then problems. Yeah, of course. So we have a micro bio break, but okay. nobody is allowed to leave the session. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. I still don't understand how this happened. I mean, let's see if it works now. I'll just start this Acrobat reader once again.
Ah, uh -huh, no, it's working strange. Yeah, by the way, you can also find the slides uh, later on if you're interested also on our, our website. Um, so in the autumn session, uh, 21, uh, 22 uh, at the bottom. Let's see, now I share my screen again. Mm -hmm. Is it working? That yeah, looks good. Okay, perfect. Okay, perfect. So when do we go on? Sure, should I just start? Yes, I think it's, I think. Okay, great. Just... Okay, welcome back. Well, in my first talk, so we began in Minkowski space and then I dropped many structures step by step. And this led us to the abstract setting of causal fermion systems. And I mentioned that all the structures which I dropped, they should reappear at some stage in, and I call them inherent structures of the causal fermion system. And in order to explain you a bit better how this works, I thought it's best if we start with an abstract causal fermion system and then analyze how to recover all these structures. In other words, we just proceed the other way around. I mean, now we start from the abstract side with a causal fermion system of spin dimension n. And then let's see which structures we have. First of all, we form the support of the measure. This is what we call space time. So this means space time is then a topological space, first of all, but there's more to it because the space time points are linear operators on the Hilbert space. I mean, the space time points are points in curly F and curly F was formed of all these linear operators on H. So therefore the space time points are by definition linear operators. And this gives a lot more structure, namely any for every space time point, you consider the, consider the eigenspaces of the operator. If you take two space time point operators, you can multiply them together. You can consider the eigenspaces of the operator product. You can project onto the eigenspaces and all of that. And this in fact gives rise to quantum objects, spinners, wave functions, it also gives rise to geometric structures, connection and curvature, and also it gives you causal structure and analytic structures. Okay, and let me explain this a bit step by step how this works. First of all, what are spinners? If you have a space time point X, then we can consider its image. This is then a subspace sub of the Hilbert space of dimension at most 2n. And on this subspace, we can also introduce an inner product. Well, maybe the most natural choice would be simply to take the Hilbert space scalar product and to restrict it to the spin space. But this is in fact not a good thing to do. It's preferable to use the space time point operator itself as the signature operator. So this is how we introduce an inner product. This is then indefinite of signature at most n at most n. Well, and somehow what is different from the usual bundle structures and things like that is that here all these spin spaces are subspace of a big underlying Hilbert space, namely the Hilbert space H. So if you take one space time point, you have one subspace and for another space time point, you get another subspace. Okay, and this is what gives rise to physical wave functions. And this works as follows. Suppose we take a vector in our Hilbert space. So this is just an abstract vector, no additional structure. And now we want to represent this vector by a wave function in space time. How can this be done? Well, we denote this, so X is a space time point. And then we want to form a vector psi u of x, which should be a vector in the corresponding spin space. And what we do here is that we simply take the vector and we form the orthogonal projection to the spin space. So this is this pi x is the orthogonal projection onto the spin space. Okay, and then you can project onto different spin spaces. If you project onto the spin space 
at x, you get a vector psi u of x. If you project to y, you get a vector psi u of y. And in this way, to every space time, at every space time point, you get a corresponding spinner. So therefore, what you get is something which is quite similar to a, a section in a spinner bundle. And the, in other words, the vectors of the Hilbert space can be represented by sections in this topological spinner bundle. Or in more simpler terms, you can represent them by wave, spinorial wave functions in space time. Okay, then one can form the kernel of the fermionic projector abstractly by doing the following. I mean, before we want to form a mapping from one spin space to another spin space. So therefore, suppose we start with a vector in the spin space SXM. What we then do is we first act with the operator X, where the operator X maps to the spin space of, at the point X by definition. So therefore X applied to phi again lies in this spin space. Well, and then we take the orthogonal projection to the spin space at the point Y. So this gives a mapping from SX to SY from one spin space to the other. And it turns out that if you choose an orthonormal basis of the Hilbert space, then one can also write the kernel of the fermionic projectors like this. And this is very similar to the formula we had at the very beginning. But now instead of having wave functions in Minkowski space, these are these more general physical wave functions in space time. So this is the kernel of the fermionic projector. <clears throat> and the nice thing is that this also encodes the geometric structures. And in simple terms, this can be understood as follows. I mean, this is a mapping from one spin space to another. So in other words, it gives relations between these two spin spaces and between different space-time points. <clears throat> and more technically, the idea is, well, if we take a polar decomposition of this linear operator, then we get a symmetric operator and a unitary operator. And then we simply take the unitary part and this unitary operator from one spin space to another can be understood as a spin connection. In fact, one can do more. One can also introduce like a, the so-called tangent space and can construct a corresponding metric connection. And this spin connection and metric connection, they should be compatible. This is what makes the whole constructions a bit more involved. This is why I put here dot, dot, dot. So what I'm saying here is a bit oversimplified, but I hope it still conveys the correct picture. Okay, so once we have a connection, we can also form curvature by considering the holo holonomy of this connection. In simple terms, one goes along a triangle, X, Z, Y, so go from X to Z, from Z to Y, and then back to the point X. If the parallel transport along this triangle is the identity, then space-time is flat. If it's not the identity, then the deviation from the identity tells me about curvature. Okay, then there's also the causal structure, which is maybe most important. This is also why it gave it, well, it gives rise to the name causal fermion system. <clears throat> and this is quite similar to closely related to the, the Lagrangian. So it, it works as follows. Suppose we now take two space-time points, we multiply them together and compute the eigenvalues of this operator product. These eigenvalues are in general complex, and therefore we can distinguish different cases. Either if they, if they all have the same absolute value, then are called the two point space like separated. If the eigenvalues are all real and do not all have the same absolute value, then are called the points time like separated. And in all other cases, are called the points time like separated. This is a quite abstract definition, but one thing which one sees right away that this causal structure is compatible with the form of the Lagrangian. I mean, so this is again the causal Lagrangian. If the points are space-like separated, then all these eigenvalues have the same absolute value. In other words, this is zero, the Lagrangian vanishes. <clears throat> and uh, this is of course the best one can do. If one works out the corresponding Euler Lagrange equations, then one sees that they also vanish for these two points x and y. In other words, the space 
points with space-like separation do not interact with each other. And this is a general notion of causality, which one has here and also which gave causal ferment systems the name. I should also mention, as I showed you at the very beginning, in the example of Minkowski space or the Minkowski space vacuum, this notion of causality gives you back the notions of causal, of causal structure in Minkowski space. Because in the time for time-like separation, we had two real eigenvalues. For space-like separation, the eigenvalues form the complex conjugate pair. Okay, there's also a distinguished time direction, which I wanted to mention, namely if you write down this functional, looks a bit complicated at first, also we don't need the details. The point is that it is, it is first of all real valued and it is anti-symmetric. So if you interchange X and Y, you get a minus sign. Therefore the sign of this functional can be used to define future and past. So this is a time direction. I should however point out that this resulting relation is in general not transitive. So this means there could be close time-like curves if you like either on the large scale but also on microscopic scales. So therefore the structure you get here is not the same as a causal set also although it is somewhat related. Okay, so these are the basic inherent structures of a causal Fermi system. And now one can work out the correspondence to the structures of Minkowski space a bit in the style I explained it, but one can work all this out in, in great detail. Good, now let me move on. How can one get a connection now to the standard equations in physics, say Maxwell equation, Einstein equation, Young-Mills equations, equations of quantum field theory, <clears throat> and the first step towards this goal is the so-called continuum limit. <clears throat> and schematically, this works as follows. I mean, we have causal Fermi system, the abstract mathematical framework. We have quantum geometry, causal action, what I showed you so far. And in the continuum limit, I want to get a description, an effective description in terms of Dirac fields, in terms of strong and electroweak gauge fields, gravitational field. And this is done here on the level of second quantized fermion field. So the Dirac field is second quantized, where we have this many particle state. However, the bo both bosonic interaction is just classic. So this is, as I said, the first step, and this is what's done in the continuum limit. And this is worked out in detail in this, in the book, in this blue book, which also contains a detailed description of the abstract formalism and all of that. And let me explain what is the input, what do we get out, what is the general procedure. <clears throat> and what one needs to, the input is roughly speaking, the vacuum. So we have to say, how does the vacuum look like? And what one does is one takes the sum of Dirac's, and the sum here corresponds to the different generation of particles. So here's a general parameter G, one also sees that one, that one gets consistent equations in the continuum limit only if one has three generations. So this G here really should be three, say electron, muon, tau, if you like. One can also consider systems which are a bit more complicated in order to describe strong and electroweak forces. And this is now where this number eight comes up, which we just discussed. Namely, one takes the direct sum of seven identical summons as we had before, plus another direct sum. And so in total, eight direct summons, again with three generations. So this means like if you think of this P of X, Y, you write this as a matrix, this is a four times eight, so 32 times 32 matrix, or in other words, the corresponding spin dimension is equal to 16. So this system again has to be regularized on the Planck scale. And here one has to break the chiral symmetry of the eighth direct sum. And so one sum is different from the others. This is where we break the left right symmetry. And this accounts for the fact that neutrinos are only left handed in the end. So this is also put in. 
Okay, then how do we analyze the continuum limit? So the general procedure is, well, first of all, one writes down a Dirac equation for this whole ensemble of wave functions for all these direct summands. And then one introduces here a potential or, or a perturbation operator, if you like, and this should be as general as possible. So the more general, the better. I mean, of course, there are certain constraints because it should still be possible to compute things. So for example, you can take here general, any gauge fields, any left and right-handed gauge fields. We even considered non-local potentials to a certain extent, so non-local operators. Then one can compute the corresponding kernel of the fermionic projector, compute the eigenvalues of the closed chain, plug it into the Euler Lagrange equations of the causal action principle. So these are quite long computations. And then the question is are the Euler Lagrange equations satisfied if one removes the ultraviolet regularization? And the answer is yes, they are satisfied, but only if this operator B here, or the potential B, has a very specific structure and satisfies the classical field equations. So this is the procedure. Okay, and in fact, one in this li continuum limit, one really gets uh, agreement with all the interactions of the standard model and one gets classical gravity, at least on the linearized level. Okay. So this is the continuum limit where one gets just classical bosonic fields. Now let me move on to going beyond the continuum limit. Can we do better? And in fact, there's one thing which is kind of missing right now in the whole setup, namely what are objects in space? So somehow this is an important point because first of all, in our daily experience, of course, everything takes place in space and time is just a parameter. But moreover, it is important for quantum physics. You needs densities, integrating all these densities gives probabilities and integrating means always integration over, over space, not over space time. Another example why this is important right now, this scalar product of the Hilbert space is given just abstractly. But in Dirac theory, it's quite different. It is represented as a spatial integral. So in other words, is there an analog of this usual uh, well, integral over the wave function, spatial integral over wave function, which gives the scalar product? Is there an analog of this in the setting of causal Fermi system? And this is related to conservation laws because this Dirac current conservation, this is the basis of this introducing the scalar product because otherwise the scalar product would depend on the choice of the Cauchy surface. So the fact that this scalar product is time independent corresponds to a conservation law, namely current conservation. So therefore the question is, are there also conservation laws in the causal Fermi system setting? And ultimately we would like to know what is the quantum state? What are quantum probabilities? And in order to understand this, we have to go a bit deeper into the inherent structures of a causal Fermi system. And in order to tell you what uh, one basic structure right away, we always work with so-called surface layer integrals. Now, what is the surface layer integral? So we want to integrate over space, but it's not clear how to do this. It's not clear what the surface should be. I mean, space time could be discrete, then what should be a hypersurface? So in order to avoid such problems, we choose a set omega, which should be thought of as the past of a Cauchy surface. So we have a set omega and we have the complement, which can be thought of as the future. And then we consider double space time integrals of the form where one, variable is integrated over omega and the other over the complement of omega. Then here there's the Lagrangian and this dot, 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 this stands for uh, whatever different expressions, mainly involving variational derivatives of the Lagrangian. I'll explain this a bit more in detail later. So this is the general structure we integrate. So the L depends on X and Y. We integrate X over omega and Y over the complement. 
Why is this called surface layer integral? And how is it related to a surface or like this integral over the spatial hypersurface, space-like hypersurface? Well, in the basic, uh, well, the, the picture one should have in mind is that this Lagrangian typically decays. Namely, it is very small if X and Y are far apart. And the length scale I'm talking here about is the Compton scale. So therefore, if I consider such a surface layer integral, I only get a contribution if X lies in a thin strip around near the boundary of omega. And similarly, Y also lies in this thin strip. And therefore, you can think of this object as being an, what, an analog of a surface integral, which is like thickened. And the thickness here can be thought of as the Compton scale. So this goes back to concepts with Johannes Kleiner from his thesis. And okay, now what is the conservation law here? Conservation law that this surface layer integral should be time independent. So this means if I compute it here at initial time and here at a later time, then I should get the same result. So this is what I mean by conservation law. It's really like conservation in space time or time independence. It doesn't depend also on the choice of the set omega, similar to the independence of the choice of a Cauchy surface. Okay, now how can such conservation laws be obtained? Well, and then I've, now we have to use really the analytic structures of the causal Fermi system. We have the causal action principle. If we have a minimizer, there are corresponding Euler Lagrange equations. Let me just quickly state them here. I mean, I don't want to give a proof unless you want to see it, then I can maybe show it to you in the discussion. And for simplicity, I leave out some of the constraints. I mean, the constraints can all be treated with Lagrange multipliers. Maybe that's not so important here. The general structure is, so we take the Lagrangian and we integrate one of the arguments over space-time. Then one argument is left, so therefore we get a function in space-time, and then we subtract a certain constant, which is in fact the Lagrange multiplier of the volume constraint. And then this function here has the property that it is minimal on the support of the measure, and it is zero on the support. So this is the statement here. So if, if I try to visualize this, I draw this set curly F, as one dimension, then M here is a subset. So this is this red set. So this is our space time. And then <clears throat> this function L is minimal on the support and constant on the support, well, and just equal to zero on the support. So this is how the Euler Lagrange equation look like. So I mean, the structure is quite simple, but in fact, really understanding what this means is kind of intricate. And in order to understand this better, it is good to consider perturbations of the system. But this is similar, for example, if you want to analyze the Einstein equation, you have this nonlinear PDE, nobody knows how to solve it. Therefore, one considers linear waves, one linearizes around a solution, and then one gets corresponding linearized solutions. This is what one does here too. In other words, what I do is one considers a family of measures. I assume that all the measures in this family satisfy the Euler Lagrange equations. Then I linearize in this perturbation parameter, and then I get a linear perturbation. What do these linear perturbations, how do they look like? And here, this is shown for simplicity for discrete space time. So this yellow set is again curly F. Then we have a discrete measure. So the support are just these discrete points, which now make up our discrete space time. If I vary this measure, what I can do, I can just move all these points around or infinitesimally. I can describe this by a vector field. So at each space time point, there's a vector which tells me in which direction I want to move this point. Moreover, one can also change the weight of the measure at each space-time point, or say the volume of each space-time point can also change. And if I put this together, one gets what we call jets. So it consists of a vector field and a scalar function. Okay, and then these linearized, this linear perturbation, they satisfy corresponding linearized field equations. 
So this is how they look like. Of course, I don't want to enter the details here. Just one should keep in mind. So this is like a, an integral equation. You think that this is an integral operator. And this is made up here of derivatives of the Lagrangian and derivatives on curly F. So it's really you should think of this as variational derivatives of the Lagrangian. And this nabla here, this is a combination of directional derivative and multiplication by the scalar part. So this you can really think of as a linearized version of the Euler-Lagrange equation if you consider small perturbations. Okay, and these linearized field equations, in fact, they have a nice mathematical structure. In fact, one can show that solutions exist, that they are unique, that there's finite propagation speed. So they, they have many properties of hyperbolic equations, say whatever the scalar wave equation. One can use energy estimates. I worked this out together with Claudio da Piaggi. But then should keep in mind that, for example, finite propagation speed, all this holds only on the macroscopic scale. I mean, on small scales, say everything could be discrete. So you have all this vector field. But then you can say, if I look at the system on a sufficiently large scale, then the equations have the standard behavior of hyperbolic equations. So you have a unique, the, the Cauchy problem has a unique solution and you have finite propagation speed. Okay, and now here come the conservation laws. So now these are conservation laws for linearized fields. So they are consequence of the linearized field equations and somehow the structure of these linearized field equations fits together very nicely with the structure of a surface layer integral. And, and well, let's think of these linearized perturbations, for example, as describing linear bosonic fields, for example, an electromagnetic potential or something like that. And then the conserved quantities, there's first of all a conserved one form. There's a symplectic form, which really corresponds to the symplectic form of classical field theory. And there are other uh, useful surface layer integrals, so-called surface layer inner product, which in fact is not conserved in general. It's only conserved in non-interacting case, and it gives rise to a canonical structure in the vacuum. What about now fermionic wave functions or physical wave functions? Are there also corresponding conservation laws? And there are, and this has to do with the unitary invariance of the whole setup. I mean, if we unitarily transform all the operators, the causal action doesn't change. So if we have a minimizing measure, we again get a minimizing measure. So there's really an underlying symmetry. And this symmetry can be described infinitesimally by commutators. Well, simply because you can write this unitary operator in this form e to the ita. And then if you unitarily transform an operator, then infinitesimally you get commutators. And the operator A, which comes up here, this can be any symmetric operator. And let's take as an example, an operator of rank one. So just an operator here, which involves this bracket combination. Then there's a corresponding, so this is a, the, the fact that we have symmetries here also means that the resulting jets, so the so-called commutator jets, are solutions of the linearized field equations. Therefore, there are corresponding conservation laws. So this is this conserved one form. And this can be expressed now as a surface layer integral in space-time. One can also polarize this here. So one can put here more general wave functions on the left and on the right. This gives the so-called commutator in a product. And this is conserved provided that these wave functions satisfy the so-called dynamical wave equation. So this is very similar to the to Dirac theory. So we have a dynamical equation, which corresponds like the dynamical wave equation, which takes the role of the Dirac equation. We have a co then corresponding scalar product, which is conserved in time, which corresponds to the usual integral over the probability density. Okay, so we have all these structures now to our disposal. And now we want to construct a quantum state out of that. So what is the general idea here? So the idea is we have different, uh, different systems. So first of all, we have the vacuum, which is well understood. We construct this in Minkowski space. You have all these linearized solutions. So this is well understood. 
But now suppose we have another causal fermion system denoted with tilde here, which we don't know much about. This can have a very complicated structure. So the minimizing measure here, who knows how this looks like. Abstractly, now we have two causal fermion system. We have two space times, M and M tilde. And the goal is to compare the two systems at a given time T. Well, what does that mean at a given time T? Well, similar to before, we choose set omega, which should be the past of this time. Now we have, of course, two space times. So therefore we have to choose two sets, omega and omega tilde. <clears throat> and then we form the so-called nonlinear surface layer. It can be really be understood as a nonlinear version of what we had earlier. Nonlinear in the sense that this row tilde can be anything. It doesn't need to be a linear perturbation or quadratic perturbation of rho. So this is the general structure here. And in this way, we can whatever compare the two measures or we can get information on the interacting measure using the language which is familiar from the vacuum. So this is kind of the strategy. And well, if one wants to do this, there's a basic problem or drawback. One has to be careful. I mean, a priori, these two causal ferment systems are defined on two different Hilbert spaces. So we have H and H tilde. And before we can compare them, we have to identify the two Hilbert spaces somehow. I mean, otherwise the two, whatever, the objects on these different Hilbert spaces cannot speak to each other. So this is why we choose a unitary identification. However, this is not unique. So therefore there's a freedom which comes up in order to get now an object which does not depend on this freedom, we integrate over all these unitary transformations. So this is what is explained here. So we identify the Hilbert spaces, which gives us the freedom to unitarily transform one of the Hilbert spaces. And then we consider the corresponding unitary group. Well, if the Hilbert space is finite dimensional, then this is a compact group, we can integrate over it. Otherwise, we need to exhaust the Hilbert space by finite dimensional subspaces and take a suitable limit. Okay, but of course I won't enter the details here. Good. And now what one does is one takes this nonlinear surface integral. One of the arguments is unitarily transformed. This takes care of this unitary freedom. And then we integrate over U with respect to the Ha measure. Okay. This is the so-called symmetrized nonlinear surface layer integral. And now we can form the so-called partition function. It turns out that this is very useful not to consider the surface layer itself, but to take the exponential of it and then integrate over the group. Okay. Good. And as I said, I mean, the interacting space time can be very complicated. We want to describe this in terms of the objects of the vacuum space time. And well, and these are the linearized solutions. And then the idea is to plug here certain quantities in which are formed of the linearized solution. And this is then what gives rise to a quantum state. So the, well, this has formal analogy to the path integral formalism. This is kind of a coincidence. I don't fully understand how this comes about. And, uh, but it's not much more than a formal analogy, I would say, because we do not integrate over field configurations as in the path integral formalism. Instead, we integrate over the unitary group. And this simply takes care of this freedom of identification of Hilbert spaces. Good. So now in order to get more technically to the state, we need this operator algebra. And we could introduce this in the vacuum. And since we have these linearized solutions and we have nice scalar products and conservation laws, we can form, do this in the standard manner. So we can form bosonic field operators, which satisfy certain commutation relations and, and fermionic field operators, which satisfy certain anti-commutation relations. All this is independent of time due to the conservation laws. And in this way, we get a unit star algebra the, like the field algebra of the non-interacting space-time. Good, and now the quantum state should be a linear and positive operator on this algebra. 
and we want to compute this at time t. And well, and suppose we choose a representation of the algebra, then this can be written in the usual form using the trace of a density operator. Then you have a density operator on a Fox space, or if you consider only pure state as the expectation value of a vector in the Fox space. And the general structure of this quantum state is as follows, where the dot dot on the left and on the right are quite different objects. Let me show this on the next slide. Oops. On the left side, we put an operator of our algebra, which involves all these linearized fields. On the right side, we insert surface layer intervals, which, for, which, are, which also involve these linearized fields. So this is how the connection is made. And again, we work here with the objects of the, in the Minkowski vacuum, but since the row tilde comes up here everywhere, and we integrate over this unitary group, we really get information on the interacting measure. And that's of course what we want to have. Okay, this in fact, this state turns out to be positive as it should be. Maybe I don't enter the details here. Let's see, in fact, okay. Maybe we can, can come back to this in the discussion in case you are interested. One can also form representations of the quantum state. I mean, now we are in the language of algebraic quantum field theory, which seems kind of the suitable setting here. And, but as I said, in the end, you also get a density operator on the, on the Fox space as usual. Okay, now let now we come to this kind of outlook points, different outlook, outlook sessions sections, namely, well, I also want to enrich the discussion by telling you a little bit how things are supposed to work. What do we want to do next? What are certain connections which one could make? <clears throat> and one thing we are working on right now, together with many Nikki Kamran and Moritz Reintjes, is what is the dynamics of the quantum state? I mean, so far we have a state at any time t. What is missing is the time evolution of the state. So we want to have a time evolution, evolution operator which maps, for example, the density operator at time t0 to the density operator at a later time t. Or we would, okay, in fact, we would this time evolution to be represented by unitary time evolution on the Fox space. Is this possible? Okay, and as I said, this is ongoing work. I just want to tell you a little bit how to think about all of this, in particular, how to think of the measure rho tilde, this interacting measure, how this is supposed, how is this supposed to look like? And so at the beginning of the talk, when we consider this push forward measure of Minkowski space, then the support of the measure was just a four dimensional sub manifold of curly F. I mean, this curly F, so this yellow region, this is a very high dimensional manifold, but we only consider the four dimensional sub manifold. If you now start from this measure and you minimize, it turns out, well, this is not the best you can do. It is preferable to make the measure thicker, intuitively speaking. The support should not just be four dimensional. It has a rather complicated <coughs> internal structure, if you like. So, I mean, this, there's a certain, well, there's whatever internal degrees of freedom, if you like, which this measure also has. And well, this is made mathematically precise with method what we call microscopic mixing or holographic mixing, which is a more sophist sophisticated variant of microscopic mixing. So generally speaking, we want this measure gets an additional microscopic structure, which goes as a consequence, the support has a more complicated form. You can also think of this as microscopic fluctuations of space-time and of all the, all the structures in space-time. And what's kind of funny, I mean, if you now integrate over this new measure, you also need to integrate over these additional degrees of freedom. And this is a bit similar to the path integral where you also integrate over some field configurations in space-time and so on. So somehow there are kind of many or different connections to path integral formul formulation and on to quantum field theory in general, which we want to explore. 
I mean, there's a rather old paper where I, where this microscopic mixing is introduced and one gets the first connection to quantum field theory. <clears throat> However, I mean, this is not the final answer or not fully convincing because I'm working with the structures I get from the continuum limit and then move on from there. In other words, I work with the Dirac equation and Maxwell equation, and then I go beyond this coupled uh, Maxwell-Dirac system. I mean, here the, 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 I'm more ambitious because I really want to work with the structures of the causal fermion system and the conservation laws and all that, which also gives a much better understanding of what's going on. Okay, now I want to, as a final outlook, we're maybe coming back to Jose's question earlier, get a connection to collapse models. Also, this has not been worked out yet. So this is more what we want to do in the future. And maybe I can get some feedback from you, since I know that there are like Angelo, who is very familiar with all of this. I mean, maybe you can give me some hints or some feedback on this, on this idea. Generally speaking, I mean, in the causal ferment system, we have a nonlinear dynamics for this measure rho tilde. So coming from the causal action principle and all of that. We have certain conservation laws. So like current conservation, conserved symplectic form, this nonlinear non <clears throat> surface layer integral is conserved and so on. Moreover, we have causal structure and also causal propagation at least for linearized fields. In simple terms, this can be understood as there is no superluminal signaling. So no information can travel faster than with the speed of light. Well, in more abstractly, this means your points with space like separation do not interact. I mean, of course, this is always, you mean the same, you, you, we're talking about the same thing, but with a different language and it's not so clear how to translate this language and so on. So therefore, I'm not saying that the causality of the causal ferment system is really the same as no super luminal signaling, but at least it goes in the same direction and should be closely related. Okay, then there is an, this approximation where we get a unitary time evolution. So, okay, in fact, it's called the approximation of inhomogeneous fluctuating fields, but this only comes up in a certain limiting case. Okay, and then this was observed by Johannes Kleiner. Maybe there's a connection to collapse theories and more specifically to a paper by Angelo Bassi, Detlef Dürr and Hinrichs. And they say that if you have no faster than light signaling, the time evolution is Markovian and homogeneous in time, then this is already a collapse theory. The question is, can this be adapted to causal ferment systems? Okay, I think this already brings me to the end of my talk. And again, thanks a lot for your patience and I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. So thanks a lot. Thank you very much for this yeah, interesting second part of your talk. Um, okay, I see there is already uh, the first hand raised. So please, Mr. Singh. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Felix, I really think this is very exciting and promising. And I wish you luck and success. So I have many things to say. I try to keep it brief. So firstly, I think you asked just now towards the end, how to bring in collapse. I think uh, along with nonlinear dynamics, you need non-unitarity in your evolution. So you need the Hamiltonian not to be self-adjoint and have an anti-self-adjoint component, which sort of built in into collapse models. So maybe we talk more about this later. And uh, so, and uh, okay, hope you've probably, you've probably seen Stephen Adler's trace dynamics and quantum theory as an emergent phenomenon. Very, very similar spirit to what you do. Now, my, I had two questions. The first question was, uh, uh, does the Heisenberg algebra emerge or did you impose it by hand? How did you get H bar into the picture? Okay, so this is a, I mean, it's a good question, of course. I mean, also thanks a lot for all your feedback and encouraging words. <laughs> I mean, like, the, well, the way I see the, the H bar, 
somehow, well, your force is obviously a matter of units. I mean, like if you if you start from the general setup, then there are certain scaling freedoms and so on, and they also involve uh, fixing a certain length scale. So somehow, in, in the, this length scale comes up naturally the, the Planck scale, or more specifically, ratios of scales come up. So I mean, the, the way I see it, I mean, I choose units where h bar is equal to one. And if I do this at the very beginning, there's nothing wrong with this. And then the scale which really comes into play is then the Planck scale. And of course, there are also then the masses of the particles which give you another scale. Yeah, so, yeah so, so, sorry, go on. Uh, okay, but of course this doesn't, I mean, if you think, if you talk of H bar, what you have in mind, it's probably if you have commutation relations, for example, yes. then on the right side, you have this H bar. How right. does this come up? Yes. And well, ultimately how it comes up is that, let me see, can I go back here a little bit? Let's see here I had, okay, here. I mean, here I also have a commutation, a commutation relation. And then on the right side, I have a certain surface layer in a product. And if one works this out with the correct scalings and so on, this is where then also this length scale comes into play. And I mean, okay, I don't know if this is fully convincing. I mean, one way of seeing is, I mean, if I consider this limiting case where I get the Dirac equation back, say, then in the Dirac equation, there is an H bar coming up. This what I wanted to fun. add, Felix, is that yeah. for Stephen Adler, when he's, he also, like you, starts with the Lagrangian dynamics, mm -hmm. but the commutator, QP commutator, because IH bar is not there in the beginning. It emerges in a thermodynamic approximation mm -hmm. by coarse graining the underlying theory. So I was curious, because I saw a partition yeah, function yeah. So would you have maximized an entropy and got some equations of motion at equilibrium for the statistically averaged variables? So sure, good, good point. I mean, I'm, I'm not too familiar with all of this. So though, I mean, the only thing maybe I can answer right now, I mean, I, I, I need to look at up this in more detail is, well, what I can say right now is, and somehow this method of integrating you over the unitary group you can mm -hmm. also think this of giving you a coarse grain description. Nice. Yes. So yes. tilde, you can think of this as having a complicated microscopic structure. Nice. Once yes. I now describe the system in terms of fields in Minkowski space, all this microscopic structure is kind of whatever, averaged out, integrated over coarse grain, however you call this. And therefore, also like if I mean here, these commutation relations they are written down for the in Minkowski space or so in the coarse grain picture. So this is very nice. Here, yeah, here you yeah. have h bar. So in, maybe in this sense, yeah. it fits together with what you what you had in mind. Yeah. And what even yeah. Adler did. I think this is very interesting. It's very much like what Adler does. Uh, so it'll be great to look at that and compare. Uh, thank you. So okay. my second yeah. my second quick question was. I'm very pleased to see three fermion generations coming out as a consistency requirement. I think that's beautiful. It's very similar to what happens when you try to uh, construct fermionic spinners from the, <coughs> from the algebra of the octonions. You know, you're, you're, you're forced to have three generations because of the symmetry properties. Mm -hmm. There's a the SO8, uh, symmetry, which has you know, this triality property, uh, which have, because there are three representations and that naturally implies three generations. So maybe again, there's a connection. My question is, uh, did you uh, automatically get chiral fermions and do you see right-handed sterile neutrinos? Okay, good, good point. I mean, first of all, I mean, concerning this three generations, I mean, I think this is something we should explore in detail. Mm. Because here, the I think the method is quite different. I mean, what mm -hmm. I do, I consider the equations in the continuum limit. And then the question is, well, how many free parameters do I have? Do I get a well-posed Cauchy problem? If I have mm -hmm. more than three generations, then I don't, then you don't have enough parameters. So you, 
there is no the Cauchy problem has no solution in general. If you have more than three generations, then you get underdetermined equations. Mm -hmm. So this is how it comes up here. But I know that in quantum field theory and also in this octonionic approach, this comes up differently. And right now I don't see on it. Well, I, I should just how, add, Felix, yeah. when I made the Lagrangian dynamics that I made, mm -hmm. again, just by its structure, requires it to be a Lagrangian for three generations. Mm -hmm. It cannot be two, it cannot be four. So in that sense, there is again a... a so it's not only the algebra of the octonions, it is the Lagrangian dynamics. Mm -hmm. Its consistency does require uh, uh, three generations. No, sure. So maybe there is a deeper connection. I mean, I think we should explore this. Well, and then the other question was, let's see, I mean, this, what was your other question again? The car, car, are the fermions yeah, the car, 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 Exactly, good point. Let me just go here. So, I mean, the, first of all, I should say here, we work always with Dirac spinners. Mm -hmm. So there are no Majorana spinners in particular. Mm -hmm. These, that is not considered here. So, so we, also the neutrinos are formed of Dirac spinners. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we break the chiral symmetry, which means that this left-right symmetry is broken in a rather general way. Mm -hmm. Moreover, uh, at least one of these neutrinos should be massive. So one of mm -hmm. the, why is this regeneration? One of them should be massive. This is also something which comes out. And then we always have both the left and the right-handed components. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if they are, in, but, but only the left-handed components couples to the weak gauge fields. So this means there are also these right-handed neutrinos. Around. They are also there. In the massless case, they do not interact. So this means they are sterile in, in your, I mean, in your terminology, if I understand this right. In, if, they, if they are massive, then they come into play because the left and the right-handed component are coupled in the Dirac equation. Right. So this is how it, how it is here. But as I said, I think it's, it's a bit different from what you told us in your seminar talk because here it's really Dirac spinners. And I haven't mm. looked into, I don't know if this works with Majorana spinners as well. I don't know. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. So the next question is by Dirk. Yeah, thanks, Paula. Um, Felix, um, uh, first, before I pose my question, let me ask if this view is, is correct. Um, in order to retrieve now the standard model, for example, I have understood that we have basically three ingredients. We have the action principle with all its components, yeah, the underlying Hilbert space, the topological measure space, and uh, then, of course, the selection of, of the script F, um, um, which then in the end gives us somehow the concert of space time. But then I understood um, we have two more in ingredients. Yeah, so the second ingredient is basically like here on the slide a choice of, of a vacuum uh, uh, around which we perturb mm -hmm. uh, and then the third one uh, and, and there's my question if I, if I caught this correctly you said if you then perform a continuum limit you get other constraints that somehow um, tell you what kind of uh, fields or interactions mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in the end you, uh, you can get out I, I mean now the, uh, the bosonic fields or the, or the I think mm -hmm. in there it was still the classical uh, bosonic fields, but um, it's, it's, it's that, so my first question is: these three ingredients are this is all the information you need to get the standard uh, yes. model out. So, okay, let me try to answer. I mean, I mean, first of all, I wanted to point out for clarity. I mean that the for the Hilbert space and this curly F. I mean, there is not there are not many ingredients actually. I mean, the Hilbert phase is just a dimension which this determines this. Well, then there is this spin dimension which is just like one parameter, and this is it. So everything else is the measure. So the measure really describes the whole system. And now I have to specify the vacuum. This means I have to tell you what how by which measure do I describe the vacuum. And this is done in this way. So I mean, this p of x y again is only a device in order to construct the measure. Mm -hmm. And then, and this measure will then be a minimizer 
of the causal Fermi system, or of the causal action prism. So this means we have a specific minimizer which describes the vacuum. And here we put in all this information, also the masses of the mm -hmm. particles and all of that. But we don't say anything about how, they inter how the interaction looks like. Mm -hmm. And now we want to analyze measures in the say neighborhood of this given measure. So how do measures look like which are formed by perturbing the system? Mm -hmm. And but here still keeping only... in a local extremum of the action, right? Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. so in other words, I want to, well, and of course, uh, the space of measures is huge. I mean, here we restrict yeah. attention to, well, to specific class of perturbations of the measure, namely those which can be described by classical potentials. Mm -hmm. right? And in this way, we generate a certain class of measures which are all, all close to the vacuum measure in the sense that one cannot describe them perturbatively. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then the question is like, which of these measures satisfies the Euler Lagrange equations? Mm -hmm. And most of them won't. They will satisfy the Euler Lagrange equation only if this B is, a, is of a specific form. So, this way, one can translate the Euler Lagrange equations into equations for classical potentials. And these constraints, um, I mean, we're now talking even before the continuous limit, right? These con con constraints really come from the action principle? Yes, but always in the limit epsilon to zero. So okay. We mm -hmm. take the order Lagrange equations, and then we can evaluate them in the limit epsilon to zero, asymptotically. But before we take the limit, uh, can you all also categorize classes of constraints that um, look similar to yeah, those and interactions that we have? Difficult. I mean, like as I said, I mean the Euler Lagrange equations. I mean, here they are. I mean, they are. They don't look so complicated. Mm -hmm. But if you now write down this little l, for example, for this system which we constructed, including a cutoff, mm -hmm. it's not clear how to do this. Or at least, okay, okay. I mean, at least when the book was written, it was not clear how to do it. Let's put it like mm -hmm. this: the continuum limit. This is not made use of. Mm -hmm. Instead, mm -hmm. we take the limit epsilon to zero right away because then one can think, consider well which terms diverge, mm -hmm. then only analyze those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. And when doing this, then one sees that this potential here has to have a certain structure. And in addition, it has to satisfy differential equations. Yeah, yeah my question goes a bit, I guess, in, in the, or my interest goes a little bit in the direction of, I mean, what structure that you impose, is it really in the end that then enforces, for example, the type of interactions that we see in the standard model and so on. Okay, this is a good question. I mean, so I mean, from the whole analysis, one can understand this a little bit, namely in terms of the generacies of the eigenvalues of the closed chain. Mm -hmm. Let me just go back to the causal action somewhere here. Let's see. Okay, here. So I mean, this causal action vanishes if all the eigenvalues have the same absolute value. If you now start perturbing the system, then all these eigenvalues change. Mm -hmm. And then you try to arrange that they still have the same absolute value. Mm -hmm. And well, in, in simple terms, this means you want to keep degeneracies of these eigenvalues. I mean, if you if you are in the vacuum, you just have two eigenvalues. I mean, you have, this is, uh, what was the dimension again? 32. So we have 32 eigenvalues, but mm. in fact, you only have two distinct ones. So they are both 16th fold degenerate. Mm -hmm. If you start perturbing the system, then the eigenvalues move all over, then this Lagrangian typically gets large. So this means you want to keep degeneracies of the eigenvalues. Mm -hmm. And this is why, for example, this weak, in, this weak potential acts onto these three uh, the pairs of sectors always in the same way. Mm -hmm. Because in this way, the eigenvalues in each of these blocks are the same. So you keep this degeneracy. I see. So you say basically um, the epsilon to zero limit is more or less something like a microscope to, to make these uh, um, uh, 
yeah, this, this effect visible in, in, in the limit, mm -hmm. but you could already see it uh, in, in, yeah, in, in not such a sharp way uh, by analyzing the degeneracy of the eigenvalues. Exactly. So some, okay, like in a, on a non-technical level, yes, but of course, mm -hmm. then it falls down to, well, which degeneracy do you, do you want to have? Then it gets a bit more tricky. Mm -hmm. So, so then it's more like, I mean, the choice of vacuum plus the, the, the choice of this action principle is, um, are the only ingredients. Somehow the epsilon to zero okay. limit is more or less like a looking glass. Um, no, sure, exactly. I mean, this is for technical reasons. I mean, otherwise mm -hmm. it was not clear how to analyze the Euler-Lagrange equations. Okay. And maybe if, if I may, Paula, the, the mm -hmm. more technical question, if we say um, the perturbations of, of the... Um, of, of this vacuum that, that we start with. Um, is it clear? I mean, uh, certainly mathematically, you will, you will have your, uh, probably your, I don't know, norms or metrics or, or, or whatever to judge, I mean, how big a perturbation is. But is, is there an intuitive understanding of how far we are away from, from a vacuum? Or is, is, are these questions sensible? Or since these are all minima, they are all valid physical systems, it's not even sensible to ask if there's a distance between them. Okay, this is of course a very good question, but this is difficult. I mean, okay, let's put it like this. I mean, if we work on this level of say classical fields, mm -hmm. then first of all, one knows uh, the, PD, the, the, the hyperbolic equations have solutions. So and therefore, everything is well-defined. So in other words, we get like non-perturbatively defined measures. Mm -hmm. Now for computational purposes, this is not too helpful. I mean, if you really want to compute things, then you need to do it perturbatively, just order by order. And then we know that it's also, everything is well-defined and finite order by order. One can even compute things using this light cone expansion methods, but when doing these computations, we usually don't care about Really convergence of the mm -hmm. expansion. In other words, we just go to a certain order, what we are interested in, and then we stop. Mm -hmm. And this is somehow, well, it's of course, it might be one would always like to do things better, but I mean, this seems fine mm -hmm. at least for the moment because we already know that with non perturbative methods that the objects also exist without doing a perturbation expansion. Mm -hmm. Now concerning distances, of course, I mean, if you do, if you consider classical potentials and you perturb, I mean, then you can whatever write down suitable Sobolev norms of the potentials and in this way specify what you mean by distances. <clears throat> but uh, okay, but uh, you can also do this abstractly. I mean, if you have like two measures, then you can look at something like what is the distance between such measures by taking whatever total variations of the difference of the measures and things like that. So in other words, there are abstract tools to specify what is the distance of how close are two measures. Mm -hmm. And then there are these methods which come more from classical field theory, <clears throat> but there hasn't been, there's no, no connection has been made so far. Mm -hmm. I see. Mm -hmm. Also, it's not so easy because, I mean, there is always this limit epsilon to zero involved. I mean, this classical system, if you start with classical fields, you introduce like this uh, regularization on a scale epsilon, and then you get the measure. That therefore, if you compare the two sides, then you always have to keep in mind that this depends on epsilon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But, okay, but in the end, there's not much known. In other words, we do not know whether the measures which we can construct in this way really cover all the interesting minimizing measures. Mm -hmm. I would guess not. I mean, it's a really very specific class of measures which we can analyze at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was thinking a bit more in the direction of, <coughs> the, I, I mean, looking at the orders of perturbation, could one say, for example, um, yeah, in, in, in a certain um, new regime, let's say energy regime, uh, so we, we should see other, uh, for example, interactions than just the ones that we know wow. from the standard model or so. Uh, I thought this, maybe it's possible to define a distance that we can relate then to something physical, like for example, the, the energy scale, 
and 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 divide somehow like we do it also in a standard model divide some interactions into certain regimes of of where we expect phenomena to happen no? Okay, now I think now I understand what you mean. I mean, maybe then let me go just back to this formula of the light cone expansion. I mean, here we have an expansion where we order by the singularity on the light cone. And this can be translated into powers of the Planck length. So I mean, <laughs> things are less singular on the light cone. Since we evaluate things very close to the light cone, this gives higher powers in the Planck length. <laughs> so therefore here you can really say that the, ter the terms which are further down will be very small corrections. And if you are in this light cone expansion picture, then this can even be done non-perturbatively. So this means that if I go here to a certain order, say up, I keep all the terms with T0, then I can even write them down non-perturbatively. I can even, so I can sum over the perturbation series, which gives like gauge phases. And once I have done this, there's only a finite number of terms. Mm, so therefore see. here everything is under control so this means then you can say well if you for example take the continuum limit <clears throat> see of the if you want to get the maxwell equation then the term which is important is this maxwell current and the maxwell current down here mm -hmm. then there are many terms coming further down <coughs> but they will only give corrections of higher order in the Planck length so this is why they are maybe not even so interesting because they are so small that there is no real hope that they could be detected. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how I see it. I mean, so in other words, like if you talk about corrections higher order in the Planck length, well, there are many of them. But how, how do you want to measure them? So this is why we want mm -hmm. to look for effects which do not involve the Planck length, say, which involve only the Compton length or whatever. I mean, this is what we would hope for. Or maybe that there are effects which can be explained in this setting, which cannot be explained in standard quantum field theory. For mm -hmm. example, we wrote a paper on baryogenesis just lately, together with Claudio Paganini, where we and, and uh, Maximilian Jokel. I mean, this would be like a, a, a suggestion where we say this is an effect which can be explained naturally in the causal Fermat system context and which cannot explain, at least not in this way, using other methods. So this is what I'm where I mean, this is the direction where I think <clears throat> there is hope that one really gets connection to experiments. I see now. Okay, but, but I think this I understand better now. I don't know, I, I don't want to uh, suppress all other questions. I mean, if there are other <laughs> questions, I mean, I would have two more, but in case there are other questions, I would. Um, yeah, I, I would like to ask a yeah. question, but I, I don't find the button to raise my yellow oh, okay. hand. So uh, this nice. hand is enough, Michael. <laughs> so, hi, everybody. Hi, Felix. Thank you Hello, really for hi. a very interesting talk. So, I each time I hear a little bit of it, I believe I understand a little bit more, but uh, I have a question regarding uh, the point that you say uh, you are, do obtain hyperbolic equation and there's a speed limit. You call it superluminal, uh, no superluminal signaling. So uh, uh, what does that imply if you want to analyze bell type experiments? Well, wouldn't that mm -hmm. suggest that somehow you uh, would get uh, uh, no violation of the bell inequalities? No, I, no, I don't think so. So I mean, I think I think one has to be careful here. I mean, these what I consider here are the linearized field equations, which more correspond to whatever classical equation you consider linear perturbations of the system. And <clears throat> when analyzing this, we also have to make certain assumptions, which we call hyperbolic hyperbolicity assumptions. And those can be anal can be verified, for example, if you go to Minkowski space and you consider an electromagnetic potential as a concrete example, then these hyperbolicity conditions are satisfied. If you now go to a general space time, then I don't see a reason why this hyperbolicity condition should be satisfied. Mm -hmm. And moreover, I don't see how this meshed methods should apply to the global quantum state. I mean, this linear field equation correspond more to the one particle picture. So we have whatever uh, one photon, which does not interact with its environment and is just flying around. 
If you consider now a system of many particles which are in an entangled state, this would more correspond to this quantum state, which I constructed here at the end. Let's just move there quickly. <clears throat> so, I mean, this quantum state here, this is now something which describes globally in space the state of the whole system, many particle systems, so many fermions, many bosons. Well, and here there's nothing like hyperbolic time evolution. So I mean, this is kind of this big question mark here. Dynamics of the quantum state, what we are working on right now to really understand how does this global quantum state evolve in time? Okay. Yeah, very well. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Yeah, Felix, okay, just, so then, uh, yeah. a quick remark. I think what one could say is that the quantum system does not live in space time. It lives in something, something, which is, uh, it doesn't have a concept of causality to begin with. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is, uh, this is a good point. I mean, I, I, I chose this uh, set omega, which is like the path of a Cauchy surface, and then it is globally defined. Yes. So therefore, it's not even clear how to decompose this into spatial, into things localized in spatial regions or something like that. I don't know if this, if this is what you meant. Uh, yes, yes, uh, yes, definitely, yes, yes. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, Dirk, you want to ask? Yeah, maybe one more <laughs> question about that. Um, <laughs> Since we have states already, um, at least in the linearized uh, version, um, how would you describe superpositions, for example, in, in, in this? Mm -hmm. uh, so I remember also a, a, a paper mm -hmm. about the statistical mixing. Yeah, um, okay, I see you. But I, but I, I you forgot know. everything. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is, of course, a good question. I mean, like, and this is also what we are working on right now. I mean, Maybe let me go, first of all, go back to this picture. I mean, like here, the space time is kind of the, the support of the measure is thick and then this already you can understand as a kind of superposition of space times, not quite superposition. It's, you can think of it, for example, as a convex combination of space time. You take a space time with one electromagnetic potential, one with another electromagnetic potential, and then you take the convex combination of all these measures. So this means that you, this, whole space time, you, you cannot associate a single electromagnetic potential to it, but it's a whole mixture of electromagnetic potentials. Mm -hmm. This is the general picture of this microscopic mixing. For this holographic mixing, one goes a little bit further. In fact, there, I think there is even a slide on this. Exactly. So, I mean, <clears throat> what I do is I, I describe this whole system, or the whole ensemble of wave functions by the so-called wave evaluation operator. <clears throat> so you can think of the, the, how is it? So the, you can think of this as a big matrix and the um, columns of this matrix are the individual wave functions. And this can <laughs> satisfy, for example, the Dirac equation. <clears throat> now one can introduce many electromagnetic potentials, for example, perturb them and then take a really, now it's a superposition of these wave evaluation operators. And then one can introduce here also so-called mixing matrices, and they give rise, they generate decoherence effects. Mm -hmm. And then out of this rather complicated, uh, basically, I mean, it still consists of one particle wave function, but they have a very complicated mixed structure. And out of those, you then construct the me one measure. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and well, then it turns out that in, as a consequence of these of these op operators here it involves many phases and destructive interference effects and so on. This is why you can think of this psi as being composed of different decoherent components. Mm -hmm. And then it gets interesting if you plug this into the um, into the state. Maybe I go here. It's a bit easier to digest. Now we integrate over the group. So the group transforms one of the measures. 
And in this way, it is possible that for different, depending on how you choose U, one of these decoherent components or the others are in phase. Mm -hmm. So somehow by integrating here, you can kind of trace all the different components of this uh, capital Psi, so all these different decoherent components of which this measure is composed. And well, and when you integrate over this, you get a complicated mixing sums of components and all of that. And this is how you can then also describe entangled states. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Well, th this is, um, yeah, uh, quite a bit for me to, to digest. I mean, I, I, I see that you are, um, that you have already an idea here. No, sure. But of, I mean, <clears throat> this is also, I mean, this is what we are working on right now. This is why I can't show you any papers mm -hmm. or anything like that. So, but this is the picture we have. And also it is clear that one really gets entanglement and one also mm -hmm. gets loop diagrams in this way. So one really gets all the phenomena of quantum field theory. But of course, many details have to be worked out also and many technicalities have to be resolved. Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. I mean, um, if, if there's yeah, yeah. time for one more question. question. Yes. <laughs> so, I mean, but it's a mean question. So, Felix, don't, don't, don't take it the, the wrong way. I'm not sure, I'm definitely... But don't end with a mean question. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's actually... Um, this is actually a question that the, the Detlef uh, always ask in, um, uh, yeah, in, in, in talks about like these fundamental theories. And his question was really the, put in short, I mean, what is it that your theory is about? And so if you could describe, so really in an ontological sense, I mean, what, okay. what is it that your theory yeah, okay. describes in the end? Maybe we can end with a little comment on, on that. I think that would be a nice closing. Okay, sure, I can try. I mean, I, I should say I'm not so familiar with this uh, with philosophy and the, the language of philosophers. So I, therefore, I mean, I better try to express it in my own words, although this is then maybe not so, well, it doesn't meet the standards of philosophers, let's put it like that. <laughs> but, <clears throat> but for me, I mean, we are, there, well, there is a clear mathematical setup in which all this takes place. So therefore, if we ask what is the fundamental object, then it's clear answer, it is this measure rho. It's, it is a minimizer of this action principle. This is what determines the dynamics. But this dynamics is not strictly causal in the usual sense. Also, there is the Cauchy problem can only be solved under additional assumptions and not for this whole quantum state. So this, so this means there are uh, whatever correlations between different space-time region entanglement, all these phenomena. And so there, the picture is not so whatever, you know, the present, then you can compute the past, the future. This is not how the situation here is. And of, uh, and the madam, well, the, the equations get complicated. I mean, this is why it's not so easy to understand what's going on here. But at least, I mean, from the abstract point of view, it is clear what we are talking about. And it is clear which equations to analyze, and we see that in many limiting cases, one gets something sensible. But then from this more philosophical standpoint, I mean, where we have this <clears throat> one mathematical object, so this measure, which then gives rise to wave functions, <clears throat> geometric structures, the causal structure. So it really gives us space time and everything inside, which is inside space time. <clears throat> and well, in this way, it's a kind of unified description or also picture of what space time and physics is about. As I said, I mean, this is just in my naive words. <laughs> no, that, that, that's okay. No, that should be a closing statement also. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, great. So thank hey. you very much again. Thank for, you very much. It's really yeah. nice to be here. Thank you very much for coming and thanks also to the audience for coming to this very last session. So I think it was a very nice session. Um, yeah, thanks from my side. And um, well, Dirk, do you want to say something about the- I mean, the oh, only um, thing I would have to say is that I mean, for everyone who is interested, we're um, gonna keep you posted on, on, the, um, on our usual 
channel by email. There will be um, a conference also in, in the um, in the summer. There will be a next uh, series that we will plan now. I mean, the, the lectures, uh, at least in Germany or the area, they will stop in one week. And then we have some time to think about uh, the next seminar series. Yeah, we will keep you posted and we would love to see you uh, then also the next series again. So yeah, stay healthy and uh, hope to see you very soon. And um, I think that's the, that's all I can say, <laughs> Paula. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Stay healthy. Bye. 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 Mm -hmm.